Get ready for the best holiday sale of the year. For a limited time, enjoy 50% off annual news subscriptions at inforum.news gift. That's right, 50% off unlimited access to local news so you can stay informed and connected to your community. It's a gift you'll want to give yourself. This incredible holiday offer ends December 22nd, so don't miss out. Subscribe now at inforum.news slash gift. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Growing Together, a gardening podcast with me, John Lamb, and Don Kinsler, a lifelong gardener and the North Dakota State University Extension horticulturist for Cass County. Don, how are you doing? I'm doing well, John. I'm enjoying a mild December. It's a, it's a, So far, it's a very brown December, and it does I mowed really... lawn in December. Did you really? I did. Oh. Mul- mulch some leaves. Did, were, you, were you short-sleeved while you did it, too? No. Okay. Well, still, at <laughs> yeah. least you did. Mentally, it, it was still December, so I I dressed accordingly. This is I know I know that I've I've read some stories by our by our meteorologist saying it's not unheard of, it's not rare. Correct. But it's uh, it feels it's, rare. It's still kind of a it's I mean it's like one of those things like anytime you get a really nice day, you just appreciate oh, it. Oh man, yeah. And and it just does f- seem special, doesn't it? Oh, it does. You know, I I, I want some snow for on maybe Christmas Eve or the day before. Yeah. But in the meantime, I'm enjoying it. It is. It is. It is nice. It is good. Uh, speaking of Christmas, uh, did you know that Santa has three gardens? No. Yeah. Apparently, he likes to ho ho ho. <laughs> well, with with Christmas coming up uh, and Santa coming, we thought we'd talk about some kind of Christmas plants and particularly Christmas flowers, flowering Christmas things. Because we think of you know when you think of in the deep midwinter, when you think of December, you think tend to think of the green that's that's on your tree. Uh, or on a wreath, or on you know some boughs, or or garland, things like that. But uh, obviously, there's green in house plants, but also there's some really great blooming plants this time of the year too, isn't there? Oh, there are. You know, and of course, the classic is the poinsettia. Yeah. And you know, man, what a wonderful Christmas. You know, it's got the red and green theme going. So, what a wonderful plant. You know, and of course, it's got such an interesting history. The uh, poinsettia. Um, named after the U.S. ambassador to Mexico, uh, Joel Poinsett, uh, who was also a botanist, kind of an amateur botanist. And so it's an interesting tale in the 1800s. I, I forget the exact year. But in the 1800s, when he was in Mexico, he saw these beautiful, uh, in the wintertime, he saw these beautiful red blooming plants. And so he brought cuttings uh, he lived down south. He brought cuttings, started them, uh, grew them in his greenhouse. And then something clicked with him or some of his associates that, wow, what a nice Christmas plant. So, you know, the poinsettia isn't something that was somehow created to be red and green, you know, Christmas plant. It was native in Mexico. And in fact, I've had people, I've never been to Mexico, but I've heard others that have been there say, wow, they they went there and all of a sudden these big poinsettias are shrubs and almost tree like and, and wow and so it it's got a neat history and of course immediately in the U.S. poinsettias caught on yeah. as the perfect Christmas plant and they are so nice. I heard I heard that and I'm not sure if it's a folk story or if it's but uh, that um, you know that it's it's kind of connotation with Christmas. I think this is maybe more more wish wishful thinking or wish wish thinking, but that there's this girl, poor girl in Mexico, and she uh, wanted to do something to celebrate Jesus, you know, for Christmas time, and so somebody convinced her to kind of pull up these weeds and and replant these weeds in her room, and those became the poinsettias. So. I don't, oh, so, again, yeah. again, I'm not sure. I think that that's just kind of a, a story that's told, but but you know, it's it's kind that's of some fits interesting in with that. folklore. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It. And the poinsettia is such an interesting plant. Like you say, where it's native, it becomes large, very large. And there's been a lot of breeding done in the meantime. What kind of a plant is it? I mean, what what is its species? What is it? Do you know much about it? Uh, let's see. The poinsettia. Uh, I believe that is the. Well, you caught me, John. What is the what is the genus of poinsettia? I think it is. Here, probably I'll look it up. Poinsettia. While you're, you can, yeah. yeah you can. I think it. No, euphorbia. 
Euphorbia. Yeah, euphorbia. Because one of the interesting, important things about the poinsettia plant is it is in the uh, euphorbia group of plants, and I think that might be the genus. You'll look it up. Um, but anyway, it exudes milky sap. And because it is a succulent, we'll, when we talk about how to care for them, that's an important part. That is actually a succulent with waxy stems, and the leaves are fairly waxy too. And it's a fascinating plant. I mentioned that there's been a lot of breeding work done on poinsettias. So instead of the great big shrubby types that a person would find in the native, they've uh, developed stocky plants that make a nice potted plant. And... Yeah, so were you able to find the uh, yeah? It's, the it's genus. euphorbia because uh, with it's the euphorbi, euphorbia euphorbia brachae brachae. Oh sure, um, but yeah, eighteen twenties is when it came to the U.S. from Mexico. So really, it's yeah. been around for now it's been for two hundred years. Yeah, nice time. Now, when you mentioned the species, the brachae, so yep. euphorbia brachae, it's interesting. The colorful parts of the poinsettia aren't actually flowers, they're bracts. Yeah, what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, flower bracts. Bracts are modified leaves. So the actual flower part, the flowering pl part of that plant, is the little yellow uh, inside of it. So the red part is uh, just a colorful uh, leaf modification, bracts they're called. And uh, so that is what turns color uh, and we'll talk about what triggers that, but it's day length. So kind of um, the way that some of our our trees turn color in the fall uh, based on day length, these turn color, these leafy bracts turn color also based on day length, short days. But the difference, of course, in the tropics there, they don't all drop off, uh, you know, as our leaves, when they turn color on our trees, they drop off. So interesting, uh, fascinating uh, topic so what how what's the best way to care for poinsettias because they seem you know like when you buy one in the store sometimes maybe not this year because it's been so warm so moderate but a lot of times they, they'll encourage you to wrap a poinsettia and is it a poinsettia or a poinsettia well there now let yeah a controversy because it is it ends in the, the tia right exactly yeah it ends in tia so is it poinsettia or poinsettia. Yeah, I don't know. Well, what do you think? You, know, you, you ran, well, you ran a I, I'm kind of a you know, I'm just kind of a gardener with dirt under my fingernail. <laughs> so I, I've always just said poinsettia. Yeah, uh, and I think most, I people, think most people probably around here yeah. do. I suppose poinsettia is probably more correct, but it might sound like you're putting on airs. I didn't know how to spell it until a couple of years ago. So, and I've seen, you know, I grew up with them in the house. So yeah, yeah so it's a, it's fascinating, but it is a tr very tropical plant, obviously. And it can be damaged at temperatures below about 50 degrees, which means when we go to the stores to buy them, uh, we need to cover them. And no matter how pleasant the day is, you know, if it's anywhere below 50 degrees, which is pretty common, uh, you can't just grab that poinsettia and run it out to your car. Because even a couple of seconds at uh, chilling temperatures would be enough to cause the leaves to droop and collapse, and they don't recover from that. And so anyway, um, the when a person buys it at a flower shop or a garden center, they're very knowledgeable that this is a tropical plant. Let's wrap this for you on your way across the parking lot to your car. Yep. And they'll wrap it up really, really good. Uh, some of the chain stores that sell poinsettias might not be as familiar that those are tropical plant. So they might allow you to pay for it and head out the door. Uh, so we need to be careful when we're buying, no matter where we're buying that poinsettia, to be sure that we wrap it. And the way that uh, many of the garden centers wrap them is they'll first put a tissue paper around the plant, then put that all inside a plastic bag. So I, I like to keep uh, uh, plastic bags in the back of my car, like big lawn idea. bags, big heavy lawn bags. And, and so I'll use those. I mean, I just can't kind of keep them there for any time, any time you meet and you need them. But uh, so like when I've been going into a store that I know I'm going to get a a poinsettia uh i will i Great will idea. put that in my pocket and that way after you check out you just kind of pull off to the side and wrap them up and you get them in a good sturdy bag and because i think a number of us have pro could, could relate to buying a plant when it's cold outside buying a plant at a store and then the only bag available are the little 
you know, shopping kind yep. of bags, and then try to fit a plant into one of those. And of course, the one bag doesn't do it. So then you're trying to put another bag over the top, and yeah, it just doesn't work. I like that idea of taking your own big bag, yeah. you know, garbage bag of some sort, and closing it on in. Because you could really use that bag, you know, when you're. And so when you're bagging up your poinsettia, a good way, you know, if they haven't provided tissue paper, and so if you're kind of doing a do-it-yourself. Uh, preservation. If you enclose it in the plastic bag and then maybe blow a few puffs of air into it and then seal it up quite. So it's kind of in a, a balloon, uh, a bubble yep. of nice warmer air, and then it'll transport quite easily out to your vehicle. And if you have your vehicle warmed ahead, that helps greatly. So um, because once those uh, poinsettias are chilled, uh, they aren't going to recover from that. So it's very important. Yeah. And they, but they will keep growing. You know, when you bring them home, oh, they'll, definitely. they'll keep growing. Because, yeah, they are a perennial, obviously, you know, a shrub where they're native. So we can keep those going for many, many years. Now, you, there's – I always talk about two ways that you can kill a poinsettia very easily. Of course, one is to get it chilled. Yeah. Okay, from the onset. That's going to damage it. The other way is to um, – overwater it or not water it properly. Now, we mentioned, okay, it's in the euphorbia genus. Uh, The euphorbia uh, euphorbia genus is succulents, um, you know, kind of related to cactus. And they have a milky sap. And the stems on poinsettia are very waxy. You know, if you've ever felt them, were very waxy. And that waxy coating means that they can preserve moisture inside. And they have a very uh, substantial sap, that white milky sap. And so that means that they can preserve water internally very well. And that, it, so what I'm getting at is a Another very easy way to kill your poinsettia is by keeping it too wet. Okay. And sometimes when you get a poinsettia home and it's beautiful, we're kind of afraid that we don't want to let it die on our watch. And so we'll say, well, gosh, I need to keep it well watered here because I don't want this thing to wilt. But actually being a, being a succulent, it wants to dry out well in okay. between. And so the first thing you need to do if when you get it home, if it has the decorative foil wrapper around it or a basket of some sort, make sure that that has drainage holes in the bottom and then put it in a saucer of some sort. Because if water is allowed to puddle up down in that foil container, it will that will quickly cause it to drown. And a lot of times you can feel in the you can feel the pla- the plastic pot you can feel where the hole will be through that through that foil. What I've always done is just take a pencil. Oh, correct. And yeah. just, just pop it through there, and you you create enough enough yep. drainage. Exactly. My wife uh, Mary used to work at a flower shop, um, an old flower shop in town called Frederick's Flowers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that used to be on Robert Street originally, and uh, she always indicated too that when they sold their wrapped poinsettias, they would always indicate to the customer now. Make sure when you get home to uh, scratch an opening in the bottom of that. I like the idea of poking a pencil up through the drain hole and put it in a saucer. So when trying to determine when a poinsettia needs water, okay, feel the, the surface of the potting mix. And if it's moist, then definitely don't water. Uh, if you think it might be drying a little, poke your finger into the first joint. If you can feel moisture at your fingertip, then don't water it. There's enough moisture there. But if you can't feel moisture at your fingertip, then go ahead and water. And anytime you do water, apply enough so that it'll a little bit will drain out the bottom and then discard that. So we let it dry out pretty good and then thorough watering. So the way to quickly kill one uh, is to uh, every so often, add a little water so it's continually damp and moist. And uh, so a quick way to kill it um, is— Because that's really only getting the top part. If you, if you just exactly, do a little— Exactly, or it keeps the—yeah, or it, it's keeping it too. You know, there may be moisture below, and then by adding a little bit, you're just constantly keeping it moist. You never allow it to dry out enough for okay. air to okay. be brought down in. So overwatering means keeping it continually too soggy. Overwatering doesn't mean you've applied too much at one time because the excess would drain out. So do let them dry out in between. Okay. And it's interesting. If you overwater a poinsettia by keeping it constantly too soggy, sometimes the leaves will wilt. 
because the roots have started to rot, and the roots, the rotten roots, can't take up moisture, so actually the leaves will wilt. And so that can give the impression that it's dry, so sometimes then we would tend to add more water, which, of course, makes it go downhill even worse. So again, you know, text if, with if your if finger. A, yeah, if a poinsettia actually wilts a little bit from being dry, it'll usually recover from that, but don't let it get to that point, of course. And uh, to keep poinsettia freshest, longest, uh, you can uh, remove the little yellow part in the middle. Mm -hmm. You can kind of remove that if you want. You don't have to. But um, if you want to keep it as long as possible, put it in some sunshine. Okay. You know, if you're not planning on keeping, we'll talk about how to keep a poinsettia. It's kind of fun from year to year even. Uh, but if you're not planning on keeping it beyond the holiday season, then you can put it almost anywhere in a room. You know, they'll they'll persist on a coffee table in a corner of a room. Uh, they'll persist and they'll they'll live. Because you'll see this in big, uh, like especially maybe there's some corporate settings, certainly in churches that may not get a lot of exactly. direct light, but they will just have a mass of, not, no pun intended with mass in churches, <laughs> but they will just have a mass uh, mass group of, of poinsettias. And um, in an area that, that again, m most of the time will not get a lot of direct light, so they, right. they will. But if you'd like your poinsettia to keep, and we say blooming when actually it's, it's a colorful black, bracts, but if we call it blooming. If you want that poinsettia to keep blooming until Valentine's Day or beyond, and they will, uh, then put it in a spot that gets a little bit of sunlight. Now, you have written about, I remember reading this, uh, you've written about um, keeping your poinsettia, uh, not overwintering it, but oversummering it, basically, yeah, and, and keeping it from year to year. And you just had fantastic to, to get results. get it to bloom the next Christmas. Yeah. And, you know... Um, Poinsettias aren't that expensive, so to go through a whole year uh, to get a poinsettia, uh, you know, you're not probably saving money. But I always say that for somebody that enjoys gardening, this is something that, you know, once or twice during your lifetime, try it. It's a fun challenge to keep your poinsettia after Christmas, grow it, and then get it to bloom then by Christmas the following. So I wanted to say that I've done this. I wanted to experience it, so I did. So what a person does is with your poinsettia, so if you want to do this for next Christmas, uh, so what a person does is keep your poinsettia growing in a sunny window like you would a highlight houseplant. Okay. It'll probably continue with the red-colored bracts until, gosh, well beyond February. And water it as you would a house plant, not overwatering, not underwatering, watering it as you would any of your other house plants. And then in uh, summertime, give it a summer vacation outdoors. Now, you could increase the pot size a little, but what works really, really well is to sink the pot and all into a flower bed. Um, the reason for sinking pot and all. Uh, if you just kept the plant on your patio, which you could, but it's going to need watering almost daily. But if you sink the pot and all down into a flower bed, maybe put wood chips around it, that helps conserve the moisture so it doesn't require watering quite as often. So this plant, uh, first when you do cut, move it outdoors, cut it way back. Uh, maybe four four inches above pot level. Might not have any leaves left, but that's fine. They'll quickly resprout, and uh, so get it to resprout. Start fertilizing. Very important with a water soluble type like Miracle Grow uh, or other brands similar. Um, fertilize every two to three weeks. We really want to get that to be a nice, well branched plant. So by cutting it back, it will start to immediately sprout. And you'll get a stocky plant, and you'll be amazed during the heat of summer how that plant will grow. And then in the fall of the year, it'll be just green leaves, okay? But then in the fall of the year, before nighttime temperatures get below 50, then lift the pot out, or if you've had it on your patio, just bring the plant inside. Then the key to getting them to change color is... Uh, long dark nights, you know, short days, long dark nights. Where they're native, they bloom in the winter time as the days get short. That triggers the the um, bract color change. So to get them to bloom by Christmas time, at least by October first, uh, maybe even into September, 
they need, poinsettias need a long dark night, short day, long dark night. The light from a room will interfere with that. Like the overhead light? Overhead like light. The, really? Yep. Even a street light coming through the window might be enough to interfere. They need a long dark night. So uh, what I did with ours, because by the end of summer, it was big. And when I say big, three feet high and almost that wide. So it was, it was big. It was manageable to bring indoors, but it was big. I could have maybe trimmed it back more during the summer. But anyway, um, I couldn't cover it with a garbage bag without kind of breaking some of it. So I moved it into a dark closet every night about 5 o'clock. They need approximately 16 hours of darkness, okay. you know, 8 hours of light during the day, 16 hours of dark at night. So I moved it into closet, but it needs to have that cycle, you know, in light during the day, like sunny window, and then into the closet at night. So uh, that has to happen end of September, October 1st. And then is at some point in December, it will start changing color. The green bracts will start to develop some reddish color. And at that point, once it has started, then it'll continue that. So then you can discontinue the work of in and out darkness. You've written about this before. And uh, yeah, to see, you know, for you to say it's oh, three it's feet fun. really doesn't do it justice. The photos, however, the, how big and how colorful that is. So I think if you still have those photos, let's try to get those up on the yeah, Instagram page. Because I think, yeah, I, I wrote about it for a forum garden column. Yep. And so the forum took a picture of me holding this big poinsettia. Because it's just massive. <laughs> it it's was. massive. And, and nice color. And great color and great big leaves. So a nice shrub. You know, you talked about uh, fertilizing when it's outside? Should we be fertilizing it when it's inside over the winter? Yes. Okay. Uh, so when we begin, um, like, okay, after Christmas, when you got the little poinsettia pot and all that, yes. Uh, really fertilizing about every two to three weeks. That nutrition will help it to build a good sturdy plant. And so it's fun. Like I say, it may not be something that everybody wants to do every year, but it's a fun kind of a challenge. Yeah. And it's fun to see that poinsettia grow. And so I wanted to be sure that I, I've done that and experienced that. And I'm going to do it again. That's been a few years ago. I'm going to do it again because you know, it's fun. When you're saying that this is that the plant was, you know, about three feet, uh, three feet wide, three feet tall, and you didn't need to repot it. You said that you re really you don't need to repot. You really don't for because five years. Or yeah, something. exactly. Because they they don't have such a huge root system, and they they maintain in a pot well you know you could bounce the pot up to maybe oh, an inch or so greater in diameter but you, you don't have to now one of the things with as just a kind of as remarkable as how beautiful and bold they are is that there's been a long-standing fear of poinsettias uh, especially if with children or pets around um where are we with that because i've heard different the reputation things. of being poisonous uh because there was and i i don't know the day of the year, but I believe it was in Hawaii that a girl uh, was poisoned, and they didn't know exactly from what, but they suspected a poinsettia. And so, again, that was not documented, but suspected. And so until the about 1970s, no one actually did research. And then they did research, and mice were fed hundreds of poinsettia leaves and no effect. I think they gained weight. <laughs> and uh, a no detrimental effect. And so um, so with uh, and then additional studies were done on the compounds, et cetera. And so poinsettias were deemed safe. Now that does not mean you eat them right. uh, for a salad. And if a pet or anyone does ingest them, you know anytime a pet eats uh, you know certain leaves, they might get an upset stomach, right. Uh, but there are no deaths uh, attributed. It could be an and, irritant, but it may not yeah, it may so not require it's, medical. It's not attention. considered something edible, but yeah. it's also not poisonous. right. So uh, the fear of poinsettias is, is not there any longer. Good to know, because it's really, it is a beautiful plant. And it is. It's so nice to see this time of the year. I should mention that because it has a milky, latex-like sap, uh, some people with skin uh, sensitivities uh, could be affected by that. But again, not, not poisonous, but, um, you know, that uh, some people with sensitivities, yeah, watch if you're handling it. All right. We take a quick little break. When we come back, more Christmas plants. When you can't 
make it to City Hall or school board meetings, local journalists from Inforum.com will be there to report the facts and get your questions answered. Local news works for you. Stay up to date at Inforum.com. All right, we're back. We're talking Christmas plants, Christmas flowers. And we were so excited. We were so worked up talking about poinsettias. We forgot to mention that Poinsettia Day is coming up on December 12th. I didn't know that there was one. Yeah, it's it was kind of it's uh the it was celebrates Paul Ecke. I think that's how you pronounce yes. his name. A E C K E E C K E. Yeah, yeah. Paul Ecke. And in California, and he kind of founded or started the the poinsettia industry. In he figured out how to how to uh, cultivate them and right because to... we mentioned how breeders have been active in getting poinsettias to be a nice potted plant rather than these big outdoor shrubs. And yeah, the Paul Ecke led the led the charge on that. And I think I think that's the maybe the anniversary of his death. But anyways, that this is it is a it is a state or a national. Uh, it points out a day. It's, I'll it's celebrate. Not a, it's, it's not a holiday, but it is maybe for gardeners. It is. We maybe we should do a store a show on that. All the gardening holidays. Maybe yes, that, that, would, that would be a good one. You know, uh, I've actually done programming on that because the there are certain gardening activities that can be remembered because they're linked to holidays. Yeah. let's do a podcast on that. That's a good one. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of another another big kind of and they can be quite big a uh, holiday plant, holiday flowering plant, cactus. Yes. This is, I think, you know, when some people think of cactus, they tend to think of the old spiky ones. But uh, Christmas cactus, and not only just Christmas cactus, there's a number of different holiday cactus, aren't there? There are, you know, and uh, kind of grouped into holiday cactus. There's actually a Thanksgiving cactus, a Christmas cactus, and an Easter cactus. And, and now it's interesting. I had to look this up because I thought as we're talking, okay, what's the plural of cactus? Okay, you know, I've known it's cacti, right. but... Uh, sometimes cacti seems kind of a little clumsy, but apparently now we can say cactuses. Cactuses, okay. Yeah, cactuses. Just a plural. Uh, yeah, yeah, I look, okay. yeah. And so I, apparently now uh, nobody will look, uh, look askingly at us if we slip and say cactuses. Okay. So we're, we're okay if, if I say that. So anyway, yeah, this group of holiday cac- cactuses, cacti, um, it, it's an interesting group and – What's very interesting about them, when we think of cactus, uh, we think of out in the desert. Yep. You know, these are not desert cacti. They are tropical. Uh, they, uh, where they're native, they are, and I believe it's in the jungles of South America. And where they're native, they live on trees, like kind of in the crotches of trees where maybe there's some leaf debris that's caught, uh, organic matter that they live on. And so they live on other plants, tropical in nature. So they're not out in a sandy desert. So that's going to be a key for both the soil that they like as well as the care that they receive. So an interesting group. Okay, well, many of us have long heard of Christmas cactuses. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, then what, what, what's this about a Thanksgiving cactus? Easter cactus are quite rare. Okay. okay. So, well, we might think, well, Thanksgiving cactus probably blooms a little earlier, you know, and it does, and then Christmas cactus. Uh, but there's a big other difference and a very easily e- easy difference to distinguish visibly. Okay, so for anybody that's got one of these, I want you to take a look at it because sometimes they're just, generically called Christmas cactus, but um, I want you to check because there are differences and slight differences in care. So the the actual Christmas cactus is, okay, they don't really have leaves. They have like stems, stem mm-hmm. pads. So if you take a look at your cactus and where the little stems kind of join, there's a little joint in between each of these little stem pads. And if you look at that joint, that segment, uh, Christmas cactus is smooth. They're rounded and smooth, kind of from one joint to the next. A Thanksgiving cactus has two prongs, tooth-like prongs, very prominent, easily seen at each of those joints between the stem pad. So take a look. If it has those prongs, uh, 
than it's a Thanksgiving cactus. Okay. I think of Thanksgiving turkey, their feet kind of have prongs. You yep, know, Thanksgiving yep. prongs. Yeah, think of turkey turkey feet. Yeah, yeah. turkey feet. Okay. Pointy. And, yeah, pointy. Yeah. And the Christmas act, uh, cactus uh, is smooth between those. And so take a look at those. The ones that the, the type that you buy most often now are actually Thanksgiving cactus. They might have a little sign that says Christmas cactus, but yeah. Um, okay, the reason that why most of them now are sold are the Thanksgiving cactus. They are triggered into bloom earlier. Okay. And so the marketers can sell them in bloom you know, starting, you know, we, we start Christmas shopping right away at Thanksgiving or yeah, so. Or, okay. or earlier. Or, or earlier. Uh, so anyway, um, they uh, because they come into bloom a little earlier, they can kind of mark those earlier. If you've got your grandmother's Christmas cactus, take a look. Almost all of those are the true Christmas cactus with the smooth pads. Uh, you know, they're scalloped pads, but they do not have that prong at the at the little joints. And so many of the heritage uh, cactus are the actual Christmas cactus. And is there a difference in between the flowers? There's the... a slight difference only in kind of the little yellow pollen inside, but that is so, so kind of, um, you know, and it, it's, you're kind of splitting hairs. Splitting pollen, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that—that's. I've never been able to distinguish them as easily that way, and so that's about the only difference. The flowers look essentially the same, and there are different color shades. Some are a little more pinkish, some a deeper red, and so there are color uh, in each Thanksgiving cactus and Christmas cactus. There are slight variations in color. So if you have if you have a family member or you know somebody who's gracious enough uh, who's got quite a large and, and long living cactus, how easy is it to propagate off that, or how how easy is it to take a clipping and and grow your own? Easy, and because these these Christmas cactuses can they can live for many many years. Uh, there are uh, when I put out an email once, uh, send send me in some of these heritage cactuses. Some are a hundred. I think the longest of record was maybe 120 years in this area wow. uh, that was their great grandmothers. And of course, talk about a responsibility if you inherit great grandmothers uh, cactus. Yeah. Uh, but what I like to say is because I do get emails uh, saying, gosh, I just inherited this. Cact I I'm afraid if something happens to it. Uh, okay. And I always suggest, okay, you know, care for it well. And we'll talk about the care in a minute. But I always suggest propagate it uh, from cuttings because when you propagate a house plant from cuttings, uh, it's not like something seed grown that's genetically probably different. But if you start a cutting of it, that is that same plant. So great grandmother's Christmas cactus started from a cutting that that new cutting plant that is her cactus so it's not like something second best but that is her cactus so if you want to give relatives want to make sure you preserve it for yourself start cutting so how do you do the cutting yeah the uh, easiest way to do it is first of all um, get some vermiculite or perlite from the garden center Vermiculite are the little kind of golden flakes. Mm -hmm. The uh, perlite are the white beads, little okay. white beads. Okay, and then uh, mix about half peat moss and then half of either one of those. Not not both, but either one will work. How how big of a how big of a container? Yeah, what I like to do, and sometimes we'll do a podcast on this. What I like to do is an ice cream bucket uh, enclosed in a large enough plastic bag, clear plastic bag. Okay, that works for many, many houseplant type cuttings. You're making a little miniature greenhouse uh, that'll keep the humidity up and cuttings root well. Okay. okay, so in a an ice cream type bucket with holes punched in the bottom, fill it about halfway full of that mixture, half peat moss, half vermiculite or perlite. Okay, moisten that down well and uh, Get, have a plastic bag already, clear plastic bag to enclose it in. Then take your cuttings. The cuttings should be from the outer tips of the cactus, the Thanksgiving or Christmas cactus, and probably about a four inch long piece. So that will have 
several of those stem pad sections, okay? Now, keep track which end is up. You know, okay, which end was okay. attached to, to the plant and which end was at the outer extremity because you need to keep that end up, okay? Because there's, there's a thing where is if you – because both ends are going to look kind of similar – well, you should be able to tell where you snapped it off at yeah. the one end. And do snap it off where the natural joints are. Okay. But make sure that that point at which you snapped it off goes down into this media mixture. Okay. So then after you've wet down the mixture uh, with your about a three, three to four inch stem section, um, then just barely cover the bottom part down in this mix okay you can't go too deep but just barely cover it with that and kind of press the mix down so it holds in place okay and uh, in an ice cream bucket you could probably get six or eight of these cuttings or you could stick in some other houseplant cuttings that you want to propagate too uh, you could dip the end in rooting powder which garden centers sell rooting powder and then after you uh, locate the cutting down in there and press it down kind of firmly so that the end stays in, then water it again. Then close it up within this plastic bag, punch a few holes in the plastic bag so it doesn't totally suffocate. You need some air in there and loosely tie the f top and then put it in kind of filtered light. It will probably take um, a month, month and a half for that end to start rooting. Okay. But they're relatively easy to start from a cutting. And I always suggest anybody with an heirloom type of Christmas cactus do start some additional ones. Okay. That's good to know. Yeah. That's really kind of fun. I like that idea that, that they, these can be handed down. Oh, know, yeah. Throughout and you the can years. share it with other relatives. Yeah. And it is the exact plant, not a second best, but that is part of great grandma. Not, yeah, it is essentially great grandmother's cactus. How about after they get going? How much light do they need? Uh, they should have, especially during the winter time, they should have some direct sunlight coming through a window. And of course, the light levels change as the seasons change. So during the summer, that same amount of sunlight, you know, as it gets intense and more higher on the horizon, that same amount of sunlight would cause the cactuses to turn kind of a reddish. They might even shrivel. Uh, they enjoy a summer vacation outdoors. Now, outdoors uh, during the summertime, the light level is quite intense, even kind of in a shaded area. So a uh, preferred area would be maybe where it gets a little bit of morning sun, but the rest of the day just uh, you know, shaded type area. They love an outdoor uh, summer vacation. They really put out some good growth. And they can stay in the same pot for many, many years, decades. Uh, if you do repot one, the type of mix that they use should duplicate as though they were growing on a tree in kind of some organic stuff, you know, growing in the crotch of a tree okay. with some organic material. So rather than a desert-type cactus mix, something that has like peat moss, but it also has to be well-drained with the vermiculite perlite. And uh, let's see, what else? Well, uh, so we need to bring them back in in the fall. They are triggered into blooming. A common question is, how do you get them to blossom? And they're triggered into blooming by cool temperatures. So one way to trigger the blossom set is in the fall of the year, late summer, leave it outdoors until the temperature in the evening has gotten down to maybe 45 or so for a few nights. And then when you bring it in, usually it will proceed to blooming. Really? Right away? Yeah. Within a number of weeks, oh, you know, okay, it'll start okay. flower buds. Yeah. It'll start the flower bud formation, but it will be triggered uh, by those cool process. temperatures. So, you know, maybe you, maybe you don't want to move it outdoors in the summertime, maybe keep it in. So how can we get them to bloom? Well, they are triggered, like I mentioned, by those cooler temperatures. That's why in some of the old houses, you know, great-grandmother's house, they had these up in their good living room that wasn't used much. It was probably cooler at night, and they routinely bloomed because it got chillier at night. So indoors, you can give them a cooler microclimate just by having them in a window, close to a window, that will oftentimes trigger that blossom formation by doing nothing else. 
Uh, so use that cool window microclimate or, uh, you know, or create kind of one. Um, if your house doesn't get cool enough at night, then, for example, if you keep it maybe above 65 or si above 68 degrees uh, and you don't have it by a cool window, it might not bloom at all. There is a secondary way, and that's to give it the poinsettia dark treatment. Okay. You know, but every night giving it dark, then giving it light during the day for Christmas cactus, that can be a lot of work. Yeah. And because Christmas cactus, you're, you're going to keep those for many, many years. So the easiest way is to make sure it's getting those cool temperatures. I've even heard of some peoples where it will bloom on half of the plant because ah. that was the half that was closest to the cool window. The other half won't because it was that close to that temperature, um, that temperature threshold. All so right. maybe even rotate it. A plant, so it's all even. It's getting exposed to that cooler window microclimate. And would they also be something that you'd want to uh, fertilize? Definitely. Okay. Especially during the active growing season. The active growing season, where they're putting out good growth. The active growing season would be during the summertime, early fall, when the days are still nice and long, and the plant is putting out good growth. All right. Excellent. Well, we'll take another break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about another Christmas plant, amaryllis. If you're loving this podcast, be sure to check out our full lineup. From news and local politics to sports and true crime, find your next great listen right now at inforum.com slash podcasts. That's inforum.com slash podcasts. So another big uh, kind of a Christmas plant, Christmas flowering plant, the amaryllis. And amaryllis can really get quite big. They can grow quite tall. Yeah, they can. And it's fun to see these boxed up in the hardware stores and chain stores and the garden centers. It, it's fun to see them. And years ago, I was given one of these, kind of a gift box. And of course, the direction said, well, water it and watch it bloom. And so I did. Uh, that one that I got was pre-potted. Mm -hmm. You know, some have a kind of a separate pot and a separate uh, mix and the bulb, and then you put it together. And But, you know, by golly, it works. Yep. Uh, because those bulbs have the flower all preformed down in there. So when that starts growing, produces leaves, flowers, yeah, it really, it's amazing that something can be that showy and really that simple. If you have, I would say if you have kids at home, uh, getting yes. getting one of these, it's not a kit, but the, the amaryllis, when you get, instead of going to a garden center and buying just the bulb, but if you go to a store, you know, of the bigger box stores, you can find it in a little box and it'll be, they will have the bowl or the, the pot that it should be grown in. They will have the the bulb, but then it'll have this disc of, of uh, material. You know, it's not quite dirt, but you know, it's a, Right. Um, and um, you get it a little wet, you use a fork and spread it out and fluff it up and put it in the thing. But I think that would be such a great project to do with a, with a kid to get them interested in, to get the, or at least just to get That's them exposed good idea. to seeing the growth because you're going to plant it, you're going to be able to watch because you, you don't fully submerge the bulb it, it'll be a fun thing for the kid to watch and to watch it grow and then to ultimately bloom because the results are so quick you don't have to wait a long long time no. to see results so this that's a great idea to uh, to get kids interested in gardening because they can see that so easily you mentioned to it i always get a kick out of this when you see an amaryllis bulb properly potted Half of the bulb is sticking up out of the soil. Yeah. And so it's, it's kind of unique in that as in, uh, yeah, that's the way to do it in a relatively small pot, which only a little, little, little a bit of space on either side of this big bulb and half of it sticking out above. And that's that's the way they like it. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about amaryllis because this is another uh, take. It's not it's not native to our area, right? They're a tropical bulb, and so it's fascinating—a a jungle type bulb, jungle type plant—and so it's interesting. So, okay, 
so if we buy a bulb at a garden center, kind of follow the directions for potting it up, or we buy a kit of some sort and do what they say and it blooms beautifully, then what? Okay. Yeah. So they'll last quite a while. And some of these, oh, it's fascinating. Some will send up one stock with uh, a number of blossoms. Some will send up two stocks. Uh, you do kind of get what you pay for. So if you pay a little more at a garden center, it'll probably yield more flowers. And you can also, so that's fun you can, too. sometimes you can choose your varieties there oh, too. Oh, there's different colors. Yeah, whites, there will be whites, yeah. there will be uh, white stripes, red stripes, reds. And, and so it's kind of fun, all the, the varieties of that. Okay, so uh, it'll bloom like they say it will. And then, then what do we do? Okay, so when it has, when it's done blooming, when the flowers have faded, they, they do last quite a while. So when the flowers have faded, uh, if you want to keep this bulb to rebloom, and it's not hard. Uh, the first thing you do after the blooms fade is to remove just those flowers. We don't want to let it set seed because that would take away some of the strength of it. Don't cut down the whole flower stalk yet. Uh, let that die back naturally. See, what we want to make sure we do is we want to make sure, in the process we're going to tell about, we want to make sure that that bulb builds up flower buds down in. So that's the goal. Build up flower buds down within the bulb that are going to burst forth. See, that's why when we potted when we potted or started watering these amaryllis bulbs that we buy, the reason they can do all this so quickly, they've got a that flower bud way down in there preformed. So that's what we want to do is to get this bulb to recharge form a nice big flower bud down in, and then at a certain point down the road, that's gonna come back and flower again. Okay, so leave the flower stalk on until it yellows and dries down naturally, because that's feeding the bulb. So, and then when it does that, dies back, cut it down at about the leaf level. Then continue growing these, and they've got those nice long strap-like leaves. Mm -hmm. Continue growing the potted plant like you would a house plant. Give it good sunshine, a highlight house plant. Give it some direct sunshine through the window. And then when uh, May comes along and there's no longer danger of frost, move that plant outside. Now, I like to sink the pot and all down into the flower bed. Okay. Um, the reason I like to sink pot and all into the flower bed and maybe even put a little of the surrounding soil kind of over that pot, it, it doesn't require watering quite so much. If you move it out on the patio with a, your other patio type plants, uh, it might need watering every day or so because they're in a relatively small pot. They don't want a big pot. Uh, so uh, what, whatever way you choose, just keep it growing all summer long. Fertilize, very important, because we need to build up this big flower bud down inside that bulb, and it needs nutrition. So fertilizing every two to three weeks with a water-soluble type, that's okay. important. And so when you're fertilizing your other outdoor containers, uh, make sure you fertilize the amaryllis bulb as well. <clears throat> then you can keep it growing outdoors until make sure that uh, the nights aren't getting chilly. So maybe not below 50 degrees. Then bring it indoors. Now, where these bulbs are native, uh, they don't go totally dormant. Uh, they go partially dormant based on the dry season of the tropics. Okay, so when we bring this bulb in, okay, it's still actively growing and got leaves. We have two choices. We can make it go dormant, similar to the bulbs that we buy when they're packaged, okay? And to make it go dormant, you just stop watering, kind of like the dry season of the tropics. Stop watering the potted bulb. It'll die down naturally, and then just keep it in a cool temperatures, you know, 60 degrees or so. You know, find a spot down the basement corner or somewhere, 60 degrees, and um, keep it dry in that pot for about three months. So if you can remember about three months, then at that point, start watering again. And so you can time it in order to get it to come back again for Christmas. So bring it in at some point in late summer, let it dry down and give it about three months, then start watering and you should get it to bloom by Christmas time. It'll okay. send up the same stock similar to when you originally bought it. I said there's another method, and that is they don't have to have that dormant period. You can just keep it growing 
I, I've done this. Just keep it growing as you would a house plant and keep fertilizing it. And when it gets enough energy in that bulb, it'll flower. Okay. The letting it go dormant is the best way to time it and trigger it. But if you just want to grow it as a house plant, keep it fertilized, and about once a year, it'll bloom for you. So yeah, when you've got it, so like let's say you've you brought your your let's say you started with a new to you bulb, right. you plant that. Uh, should we be fertilizing that? Like you know, if we planted it now, it's maybe it's starting to grow leaves, but it hasn't sprouted its stock, and it certainly hasn't come up with those great beautiful trumpet-like flowers. Sure. Uh, should we be fertilizing it? Or? After it starts growth. After it starts growth. Yeah, starts after growing. it okay. starts growth. Because if, if an amaryllis fails to bloom for you in the future, if it produces leaves but doesn't bloom, the reason is because it did not have enough nutrition to build up a flower bud you know, that's, got, that's one big massive flower bud down in that bulb that yields this big flowering stem. And so if it doesn't bloom, it's because it didn't have the nutrition to or conditions – enough light or something to build up that flower bud. So yes, absolutely fertilize regularly. Uh, from the time it starts growth uh, would be good. You know, the, the just fascinating think, bulbs. Well, and just thinking about this, the bulbs. So if I go out and I buy a box of a box of a bulb, or if I go to a garden center and pan pick out the bulb that I want, that bulb is probably already flowered, right? Do you yes, think? Yes, it did. Yeah, it did last year. It would have, you know, the previous year it would have flowered. And then they have they gave it good nutrition and everything, ideal conditions where these are produced, ideal conditions. So it built up this flower bud down in. They fertilized everything right. And uh, so, yeah, it probably would have bloomed back then. And then they let it go dormant. And you're, so you're buying it in this dormant stage. It's had those three months of dormancy, and they've got it all timed so that when you start watering it, starting growth, it comes out of the dormancy, and there you have it. And I never thought about it or never thought about it this way before, but I suppose it's true kind of of all bulbs or things like that. You're, you're essentially, you're buying a kind of a used plant. You know, you're yes. recycling. You are. It is recycling. <laughs> it good, is. It, good it's, point, it's, John. Taking, it's taking something that's already that's already produced. It's it's already done its thing. And you know, the, again, just like you can, if you get one this year, you can keep it for next year and the years after. Uh, I just never really thought about that. That if you're buying something quote unquote new, it's not necessarily really new. It's new to you. Well, that's a good point. So if I need to go buy a couple new colors of amaryllis bulb, I'm actually being a good steward. Yes. And, yes. Uh, of I'm recycling and I, I'm doing good things. Um, so I better buy maybe a few more. How long? I they, love the different colors. How you oh they're so they're so oh great. they're awesome. How how long will these bulbs last? As far as like how many years cycle. Can you well, get out of them? there's a record. Funny you should ask. Uh, there is a record of one being at least 75 years oh that my. has bloomed every year for the last 75 years. That's that's the longest documented. You know that could be. That, recorded. That's quite. A, that's a long time. And but but this is one that, as opposed to the uh, the Christmas cactus, you can't really propagate off a bulb, can you? Well, no, well, I well, you, you pa uh, pause because uh, kind of not, but kind of yes. So uh, you caught me pausing, but they will occasionally send up little offset bulbs, you know, actual little bulblets around this big massive bulbs, and okay. you can separate those off, pot them up, you know, start in a little pot, and it may take quite a number of years for them to reach blooming size. But I have had people email me and say, oh, gosh, there's a, a new little bulb forming at the base. Uh, what can I do? And, yeah, definitely gently uh, you know, separate that off, pot it up, and, yeah, eventually you'll have a new bigger one. Because obviously it would be the same color yeah. as the one that you originated because that's a part of that same bulb. But yeah, I suppose the, you know, the bulbs have to come from somewhere. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Yeah, I'm sure that's where the producers, how they get more of them. Yeah, is growing big old bulbs and separating off little bulblets as they form. But I guess we should say that. Be fun to see an amaryllis plantation, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be gorgeous. What if they're propagated outdoors or in a greenhouse? I'm I'm not positive. But but yeah, I think uh, my. Pointers, or we should say, is that it's not as easy to do as the the, the Christmas cactus or the right. Thanksgiving exactly. cactus. Exactly. Yeah, you can't take a cutting yeah. from them. You have to kind of wait and hope that it will kind of self divide a little bit. Uh, do you keep uh, amaryllis bulbs around to to rebloom? Yes. Uh, in fact, I've got one that is dormant now, uh, 
and pretty soon I could probably start watering it. Yeah, right now I only have one. In the past I've had others, and uh, but one of them, I'll admit, one of them did rot on yeah. me because I, I kept it too moist during the dormant season. That's, they should be quite dry. That's why the okay the dormant season. Yeah, it should be dry. Okay, yeah, dry, dry. And so when they, when you have them out to dry, you you you. I act- leave them in the pot. That's most customary. Leave okay. them in the pot, but make sure that the pot dries out well. I, I I didn't have it dry out enough before I put it in the cool area, and then it stayed a little too moist. Okay, I see. You know, another one that when you're at the store, and again, even at a bigger box store, uh, a hardware store, sometimes next to the amaryllis, you'll see paper whites. Yes, and those are kind of an interesting one too, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Let me pull and it. I learned something new. You know, count the day lost, you don't learn something new. I learned something new today. Um, I knew that paper whites were a relative of the daffodil. They're in the narcissus uh, genus of plants. And I thought that they were probably like daffodils, tulips, and things that needed a cold treatment. And I learned something new today. Yeah, so I'm reading this, uh, but the it's the narcissus pepper. Paparicius? Paparicius? That sounds good to me. Paparicius. Um, a perennial bulbous plant native to the Mediterranean region from Greece to Portugal plus Morocco and Algeria. So, again, another real it's, – it's fun that all these Christmas plants really come from these very, very warm the areas. tropical areas. Yeah. Uh, the species is considered naturalized in the Azores, Corsica, Texas, California, and Louisiana. Oh. Okay. Um, but the, the white flowers are born in bunches and strongly fragrant. Uh, it is uh, grown as a house plant, often forced to flower at Christmas. But it is um, – um, let's see – the bulbs begin to grow as soon as they are planted, uh, with flowers appearing in three to four weeks. And you had wondered earlier. Yeah, I had wondered if they needed a cold treatment or maybe the bulbs that we buy that spring into uh, flower, that maybe they had had a cold treatment before, you know, from those that produce them. But it, it sounds like apparently they do not do not need a cold treatment. Yeah. Well, interesting. You know, the paper whites are pretty. They're a pretty white. And I can picture that right beside a big red amaryllis. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. And just the, just the contrast between the two. And again, the flowers on the paper white, not nowhere near as big, nowhere near as tall as the amaryllis, but you get them kind of in more of a bunch. Right. They are really, really nice. Yep, exactly. You know, and one one reason I really like gardening in this area is because there's just there's no end to the things we can experience. And I always say my bucket list is to have grown everything that we could grow in our area, and I'm nowhere near. I have not tried paper whites. Oh, so I got to try paper whites. Maybe this. I got to add that to my bucket list. A Christmas. This maybe it'll be the Christmas. A Christmas task. Yes, <laughs> to have grown paper whites. Well, let us know how it goes, and if people have quite have. Uh, questions for you or if they have pictures of of their uh heritage christmas uh cactus thanksgiving yes. cactus i'd uh, love to hear about it. them over 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 summering uh poinsettias or yeah your experience with the amaryllis. poinsettias one year for a christmas for a column garden column i did put out um the challenge to uh winter your poinsettia get it to bloom then send me yeah. And people did. Good. There were some awesome uh, photos that came back the following December of people that had wintered and grew. And I could tell, you know, because they looked different. Yeah, I could tell they didn't just buy one yeah. and, and say they did it. But I could tell that they had they had made it. So, yeah, if anybody wants to email me any questions or some success stories, uh, email me donald.kinsler, K-I-N-Z-L-E-R, at ndsu.edu I think that'll be really fun Hopefully, yeah, we Thanks get for the emails that I, you do send yeah. I always enjoy uh, hearing from listeners And if people send in photos we can put those up on our Instagram page. Ah oh, that'd be awesome Don again so much fun talking about these plants. Yeah and everyone enjoy December. 